Institutes of the Life of Scientific Collaboration in the announcement in the 2016, um, in 2016 about the discovery of the first gravitational waves from the merging of black holes. Leading to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. You can find her in movies too, not in Hollywood, but in a brief documentary um, led, held by the National Science Foundation called Einstein's Messengers. Di um, Dr. Gabrielle Gonzalez has been named among the world's top 10 scientists by nature. She is the scientist of the year by great minds in STEM and the science education professor of the year. And it is my a great privilege and an honor to introduce to you your speaker for today, Dr. Gabrielle Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here, even though we don't have our Nobel Prize and a good friend of LSU coming. But I'm so happy you came. And I want to tell you a bit more about a new program that paid uh, for this event and will pay for uh, more events introducing students like you and teachers to LIGO science. And this is part uh, of a program uh, supported by, the, by LSU and the Taylor Foundation and LIGO. And the team working on this is the team at the LIGO Science Education Center. Uh, you might have met Kathy uh, at, the, uh, at the front entrance, and Bernita and Karen here, and Joe Giammi, LSU professor here. So let's, let's clap for them all too. Okay, let's get started. Um, I hope everything works here. Not doesn't always do. So what I want to tell you about is Einstein, Einstein's theory of gravity, black holes, and gravitational waves. And I know it all sounds very mysterious. It sounds like science fiction, but I hope we'll, get, we'll go through this journey together. You might have heard about this before. How many of you have visited LIGO? Okay, that's quite a few of you. So some of you will recognize this and, and the others, I hope, will uh, want to visit LIGO and I will tell you how to do that. Now, this will look like a physical sciences <laughs> lecture, uh, this, but that's only this slide. You might remember in school, you probably have already learned about Newton's law of gravity. And you learn that all masses attract each other with a force that's inversely proportional to the square of the distance and proportional to the square of the, um, to the product of the masses. That's the only formula I have in, the, in this talk. So you don't have to worry. This law, however, which sounds a bit boring, and I, I remember that in school. <laughs> this law is amazing because it explains not just how that apple fell on Newton's head, which is a small object falling to earth and sometimes me falling on the stairs. Gravity is what does that. But the same law explains why the earth goes around the sun, the sun and why the moon goes around the earth. Why do they do that? They do that because the earth was moving around and the sun is here and it's attracting the earth, but it's not making it go right to the sun, it's actually making it go around the sun. And that's gravitational force too. So the same law explains how the stars move, how the planets move, and how I fall down the stars. That's amazing. But there was one thing, this law has more than 400 years, uh, it's more than 400 years old, and we still use it in a lot of in a lot of cases, even for rocket motion and planetary motion, but it's not perfect. And Einstein was the one that uh, just over a hundred years ago began thinking that there was something wrong with this law. And that's because he himself, Einstein, had come up 
with a theory that had to do with electricity and magnetism, didn't have anything to do with gravity, but it was a universal speed limit. And that's not 70 miles per hour. It's actually a much, much higher speed limit. You know what that is? The speed of light. Einstein said, and we have proven that right, that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. That's a universal speed limit. But this gravitational force is instantaneous. If the sun disappears, the Earth right away begins moving in a straight line. Right away. So Einstein said, no, that cannot be. There has to be something that travels be between the two. It's not an instantaneous force. So he came up with a new theory, uh, Einstein theory of gravity, and that says that masses live in a space-time and the masses deform the space-time. And when masses move, satellites move around the sun, they do it because space-time is curved. And I know what you're thinking. You didn't understand the word of what I said. <laughs> so let me go a bit more slowly. What is the space-time? Sounds like a Hollywood movie, right? But it's, it's, it's not a difficult concept. You all have used grid paper. Now imagine a three-dimensional grid paper, a grid that measures distances. And the distances between all the points are the same. Now imagine that we put a little clock in every corner that measures time and that all the clocks are synchronized. That is what we call a flat space time. All the clocks synchronized and all the distances between the corners the same. If we have a mass like the sun in there, what happens is that the space time curves and the distances are different near the sun than farther for the sun, from the sun. That clocks run at a different speed near the sun than farther from the sun. So space time, we say space time is curved. And now you saw in the movie the, the satellite go not in a straight line, but in a curved line. But now that's not because there is a gravitational force attracting that satellite. It's because it's following the shortest path. And the shortest path is a curved path. So this law, the math of this law, is very, very complicated. We don't study this theory in college. We study it in graduate school. And that class is one of the most difficult classes we take. So I'm not going to show the equations. But the concept is relatively simple. The concept is that masses curve space-time, and then objects travel in that space-time following the shortest path, following a curved path. For example, this predicts that light does not travel in a straight line. If we have a beam of light, a beam of light will also curve like the satellite, a bit less than the satellite, but it will not travel straight. That was the first prediction that was confirmed from Einstein's theory. And there are lots of other predictions. For example, that the, that the, uh, that the black holes exist. And that, was, nobody believed it, until a lot later. But the one prediction that we are, will be talking about today is that if we have two masses orbiting around each other, like two black holes orbiting around each other, then they are going to be producing this curvature of space-time that are, is going to be wavy. It's going to produce ripples in space-time. Those are the gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are going to carry energy away from the system and make the black holes get closer and closer together. So according to Newton, two objects would go around each other forever. But 
according to Einstein, these two objects, these two black holes, would get closer and closer together until they form a single black hole. And those gravitational waves that were produced would be traveling to the rest of the universe. Sounds amazing, sounds. That does sound like a movie, but it is real. And we know what the gravitational waves are because we can compute them with computers. We have the theory so complicated that to get it right, we actually have to use these supercomputers to know what the gravitational waves look like. And the gravitational waves look like this sine wave that gets larger in amplitude and frequency. That's when the black holes are moving faster and faster. And then when they form a single black hole, it, it has a peak amplitude and then it decays. So at the very end, there is a black hole. It is rotating, but it's not producing gravitational waves. And that's because the theory, Einstein theory predicts that what produces gravitational waves is masses moving around, but the masses have to be non-spherical. So according to Einstein, I'm producing gravitational waves here because I'm not spherical, but this black hole, it's perfectly spherical, so even though it is rotating, it's not producing gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves were there for millions and millions of years while the black holes were slowly dancing this tango and getting together. I am from Argentina. I don't know if you recognize the accent. It's not from Louisiana. So I like to say that the black holes were dancing the tango and then they embraced each other, but then the the gravitational waves stopped. Now, the other prediction is that the magnitude of these waves, and what, what these waves mean is that the distances, the distances in that grid, remember, are getting longer and shorter, longer and shorter. So they're not deformed statically like the sun does, but they're moving around. That's why we call them ripples in space time distances are getting longer, shorter, longer, shorter. But how long, how much they change depends on how far the objects are. But even if the objects are very, very far, the change in distance is very, very, very small. The first gravitational wave that we detected, and I'm going to tell you more about that, made the distance between you and I and the distance between the sun and the earth and the distance between the sun and the nearest star, they all changed by a part in a billion. No, let me see. No, it's a part in a billion billion. No, it's a part in a number that doesn't have a name because it has 21 zeros. A billion has nine zeros. <laughs> How many billions are in 21 zeros? <laughs> Too many. So that means that these distances change very, very, very little. The distance between the sun and the earth, for example, changed by just an atomic diameter. So Einstein himself, when he predicted the existence of these gravitational waves, wrote that they are so small, that they probably will never be measured. But we did that. How do we do that? First, let's talk where do they come from? That's actually more exciting. I told you that they come from anything that's not spherical and it's moving. It's accelerating, actually. But those are all very small. I'm not producing, we cannot produce on Earth gravitational waves that we could measure like we produce electromagnetic waves to, uh, to make you hear music through, <laughs> through electromagnetic waves in radio, for example. These, this, the gravitational waves we're looking for come from objects that are moving very fast and are very big in mass, but very compact in space, very compact objects. And those are all out in the universe and they are, for example, supernova explosions. We do know that many stars end up 
exploding in what we call a supernova. And that would produce a gravitational wave. The gravitational wave, we don't know exactly how it will look, but it might look something like this. There are some simulations, this is simulations in a, in a computer, that it says in some case it will look like this. And sometimes to, get, to give us an idea of what this sounds like, we put this on a speaker. Now, I like to say that this is the sound of the universe because gravitational waves are not light waves, but they are not sound waves either. <laughs> they are ripples of space-time, they are space-time waves. But still, we like to put them on a speaker because we can, right? With the digitizing, uh, we can do that. And this one sounds like this. Let me see if I can. Not very exciting, right? It's a burst. It's boop. <laughs> That's it. That's what we expect that to sound. But it would be a gravitational wave. We have not seen anything like that yet. Another case that another stars that can produce gravitational waves are rotating stars. We know in our galaxy and in many other galaxies that there are some stars, some very compact stars that we call neutron stars. They are the most compact stars that are not black holes, and many of them rotate. And we know that because we receive radio waves from those signals. And this is a crab pulsar. It rotates at a frequency of, um, of, a, uh, of about, um, it produces gravitational waves that would be sine waves, and they would be of about 30 hertz. You know what that sounds like? Let me show you. It's a rumble because it's a low frequency, but it's a continuous wave. It's there all the time because the star is rotating all the time. So that's a bit more exciting. That's a bird. <laughs> and it's easier to look for because you can, uh, it's very long, but we have not found one of those yet. The other case, which is the case I told you about before, is the case of two stars, which can be neutron stars or white dwarfs or any kind of stars that are getting closer together, producing these gravitational waves and then leaving an object at the end. And that would be something like that, like I showed you before. And you know what that could sound like? Let's see. I'm going to have a quiz after this. <laughs> That's what I like better. <laughs> and finally, other things, other system that produces gravitational waves that we know produces gravitational waves, even though we haven't detected it, them yet, is the beginning of the universe. We know that at the very beginning, right after the Big Bang, the universe was a big, thick soup. And at some point, the soup got a bit thinner and photons began escaping. And we have a map of those photons that we call the cosmic microwave background. But those are, again, light waves, electromagnetic waves. They are microwaves, the same like we use in your microwave oven, the same frequency that your microwave oven, but these waves come from the beginning of the universe. We expect that there are gravitational waves that were produced also at that time of the thick soup. And they would look like noise. This looks like light noise. This looks like gravitational noise. And this sound you might recognize, especially if you have uh, played with radio. Sound of static. That would be what it sounds if we put it on audio. But remember, these are not sound waves. These are all gravitational waves. So how do we measure them? They are, we know that they are very, very small. How do we measure them? We use interferometers. Interferometers use a laser that splits in two, 
And then when the light comes back from bouncing on a mirror at the end, they come back and those two waves that are coming back are coming out of the interferometer and they cancel each other. So they, there is no light coming out. And you might think, how can that be? How can there be no light coming out? Well, if you believe me for a second, what happens when the distance changes because there is a gravitational wave going through is that they are not going to cancel anymore and there's going to be some light coming on. This video is a bit better. That's a laser splitting, coming back. No light, more light, no light, more light. We put a photo cell here and we look at how much light there is in there. That's how we measure it. Now, why do they cancel each other? Because the laser is a wave. It's a light wave. And when it bounces and the two waves come out of here, they cancel each other. You have one wave going up, the other wave going down, and they cancel. But if the two distances are different, they don't cancel anymore. And that's why we call this interferometer because we, what we are measuring is the interference of these laser waves. But the, what we do is we put a photocell in here and we measure how much light there is in that photocell. If there is more light, less light, more light, less light, then that might be a gravitational wave. In general, however, it's noise because what we want to measure is something that's very, very, very small. I told you that the amplitude of the gravitational wave we are looking for is one part in 10 to the 21. That one with 21 zeros. <laughs> How small is that? I told you that that's like comparing an atom to the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And we cannot build an interferometer that large. So what do we build? Well, we build something that can measure this very small one. And that is, this is just to remind you what that was. And that is the two LIGO detectors. Le LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And now you know all the parts of this. It's a laser interferometer that looks for gravitational waves. We have to make it very, very large. So how large are they? Well, you can go and visit it. That's LIGO Livingstone. It's in Livingstone, Louisiana, just around the corner. And it's four kilometers long. Now, we use metric system in science. You probably don't remember that. But you know how long in miles is four kilometers? It's about two and a half miles. Two and a half miles on each side. That's how long the laser has to go and come back for us to measure something, something very, very tiny. And you know how big is the distance that we measure? How much that four kilometers, that two and a half mile distance gets longer and shorter, longer and shorter? That is less than atomic diameter because that was the case if the distance was between the Earth and the Sun. It's less than a proton diameter. It's a part in a thousand of a proton diameter. Imagine that we are measuring this distance getting longer than this distance by a part in a thousand of a proton diameter. Sounds impossible. Einstein was right in being doubtful that this would ever be measured, but we did measure them. And we did it with these two observatories, one in Livingston, Louisiana, that you can go and visit every third Saturday of the month for those who haven't been there. There's an open house every third Saturday. This Saturday is the one this month. You can also go with your school if you talk to the people at the Science Education Center. There's another in the desert of Washington, in Hanford, Washington, and we have two because these signals are so small that, and the detectors are noisy, that if we, be, if we see the signal in one detector, we just wouldn't believe it. 
to believe it's astrophysical and not a truck going nearby or a train like is the case with Livingstone, we need to see the same signal in two detectors that are very, very far away. And that's how we know it's an astrophysical signal. Now, it's not just a simple interferometer like I showed you before. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. The mirrors in here are big mirrors like these that are hanging from glass fibers that are hanging from another piece of glass that are hanging from blades in what we call a quadruple pendulum. And you know why we hang these mirrors? Because that way they move less. Now, how can a mirror move less if you hang it? Well, you probably have all played with yo-yo. I always forget to bring a yo-yo here. Does anybody of you have one here? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> if you have a yo-yo, and instead of playing the right way, going back and forth, and you do different things, I always like to do things that are not in the instruction booklet. <laughs> Um, if you move it side to side, if you move it very slow, then the yo-yo will just move the same. But if you move the top very fast, the yo-yo will not move as much. So that means that we are isolating the motion of the yo-yo from the motion of the suspension point. So if we hang from a frame that's attached to the ground, we hang the mass on a pendulum. If the, if the ground moves at frequencies, the gravitational wave frequencies are frequencies of about 100 cycles per second. So at those frequencies where the ground is moving, the pendulum is not moving as much. At low frequencies, it is moving with the ground, but we handle that by pushing on the mirror to make it stay in the right place. But we have to play that game several times. That's why we have a pendulum hanging from a pendulum, from another, from another. These mirrors are state-of-the-art mirrors, the most expensive mirrors in the world. Uh, they are, uh, they are uh, and all this is hanging from an active seismic isolation system which also helps us reduce the noise of the ground. What we do is we measure the distance between these layers and we cancel it. We push for them to counteract the motion of the ground. And then we have the pendulum hanging from that, all of that in vacuum because the laser light has to travel straight and that only happens in vacuum. So this is a vacuum tube that's four kilometers long, protected by an enclosure. And you know that protection, some people said, oh, you may not need that, but that protection protects the, the beam tube, not just from the wind and the rain and the elements, but also from fires that happen at Hanford, from hurricanes, strong winds that happen here, from alligators in Louisiana, from crushing cars, there was a car that actually crashed into the beam tube in Hanford. <laughs> so we've had all kinds of things trying to get to our beam tubes and didn't because we have that enclosure. So we have the vacuum chambers, we have the laser light traveling vacuum, we have a big laser, a big powerful laser. We have to play all the tricks in the world to make this as sensitive as it needs to be. But, and once it's all there, once everything is in the vacuum system and the laser is going back and forth, we do it from the control room. We control it from the control room. That's what we do most of the work. After everything is installed, the control room, which you can visit if you go to LIGO. You, we have lots of computers monitoring lots of things in there. We always, if we, most of the time, we look worried, looking at the computer screens, trying to understand what's producing the noise and how can we make the noise smaller. And sometimes we succeed <laughs> and we celebrate. We are here, uh, she's celebrating not a dis uh, the discovery of a gravitational wave. That, in general, takes a little more time to find. But getting the interferometer to operate the way we want which sometimes takes years, but it's a lot of fun.
actually not, but I like the most doing. And this is what we discovered. The first gravitational wave that we discovered was on September 14, 2015. That date is ingrained in my mind. <laughs> it was amazing, amazing. We could not believe it, truly, we could not believe it. I look at this wave and sometimes I cry <laughs> from emotion. <laughs> I know it looks like a plot, <laughs> but let me explain why it su produces such a strong emotion. The blue, the blue curve is the light on the photocell at the Livingston detector. And in general, what we see is noise. And the orange is the, the light that we see at the photocell 4,000, uh, 3,000 kilometers away at Hanford. And again, it looks like noise, and in general, it doesn't have anything to do with the noise at Livingston. But here is what we see, something that looks like a sine wave that gets larger in amplitude and in frequency. Look, this is shorter than this, and this is shorter than that. That means the frequency is increasing, and then it has a peak amplitude, and then it goes back, not to zero, but to the normal noise. And look at the amplitude. This is the fractional change of that distance of four kilometers in each of the two detectors, and that's 10 to the minus 21, a part in 10 to the 21. And this looks like the computers predicted would be the signal of two black holes colliding. And not only that, but from the amplitude of the signal, we could tell that these black holes were, had merged a billion years ago. This had happened a billion light years away. When this happened on Earth, not only we were not born, humans didn't exist, animals didn't exist, fish didn't exist yet, only multicellular organisms were created. And while this gravitational wave was traveling in the universe to Earth, on Earth we had fish and animals and humans and Newton and Einstein and us building the detector and you going to school. Well, were you in school in 2015? I think so. <laughs> Most of you. And then it went through Earth and then it kept going. Now it's four, <laughs> more than four light years away. It was amazing, amazing. And these black holes were big black holes. Each black hole, we could tell from the frequency of this, each black hole had 30 times the mass of the sun. In fact, one had 29, the other had 36 times the mass of the sun. And when they merged, they formed a black hole that was 62 times the mass of the sun. And this is when I know who likes math. I said 29 plus 36 equals 62. Is that right? No, it should be 65. But it was 62 because three solar masses were converted into energy, energy of the gravitational waves. That's the energy that the waves carried away. Three solar masses. Remember that Einstein formula E equal mc squared? The energy was three solar masses times c squared. That's the energy that all the stars in the universe produce in this fraction of a second. Notice that this is only, a, this is a tenth of a second. So this was amazing. So amazing that it actually took several months to convince ourselves that this was true. And then we convinced ourselves, we wrote an article, we had it reviewed, and on February 11, yesterday was the fifth anniversary of this, February 11, 2016, we could tell the world, we did it. <laughs> and this was Ray Wise and Keith Thorne were at that event. See, I had Keith Thorne in the, not in person, but at least in pictures here. 
Uh, I was there, they write me as head of the LIGO laboratory, Franz Cordova as head of the National Science Foundation who has paid for all these experiments for more than 20 years. And you know what was so special about that day too? Do you know why February 11 is special? Not, not because of our discovery, but that, that time was the first time it was celebrated, and since then it's celebrating every 11, every February 11, it's the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And there we were, two women about <laughs> in five scientists. It couldn't have been better than that. It was a great coincidence. So every February 11, I have two reasons to celebrate, but I hope you all celebrate it from now on. Now, what did we do with this? Well, we put it on sound. <laughs> Remember the sounds we heard before? Let's see if you recognize it. Did you hear it? Kind of, right? <laughs> This is a wave that I showed you before. This is in Hanford, this is in Livingston. This is a diagram that we like to use where the light, the brightness shows the strength of the signal as, the signal as a function of time and frequency. So here where the frequency is increasing, then it's going up. We call this a chirp, but it didn't sound like the ones I showed you before, right? And that's because these frequencies are low frequency. It's a low rumble. So it's difficult to hear. So we cheated. We actually did what astronomers do. You have seen those beautiful pictures of in, in the infrared and the ultraviolet. And the infrared and the ultraviolet are invisible. <laughs> the human eye doesn't see that. So they painted red and blue. So that's what we did. We actually added 400 hertz to the signal. And then you might recognize the sound. Let's see. So that's the original sound. Can you hear it? What? That's the chirp. That's what we like hearing. It's not so obvious because there is a lot of noise in the signal too. And that's why we don't look for this signal just listening or looking at the wave. We actually do a lot of analysis of the signals with computers. And this led to the Nobel Prize in 2017, mostly to the people who have been working on this from the beginning, Kip Thorne and, and Ray Wise. Uh, Ray Wise is an adjunct professor here at LSU. He visits LSU and, La and LIGO. Livingston very, very often, and we hope to bring him. We hope to bring Kip Thorne again. Well, not again. We hope to bring Kip Thorne to you <laughs> for real, <laughs> and then we will bring uh, Ray Wise too. Uh, they had this concept of LIGO in the 70s, and I'm sure that's before you were born, because that's shortly after I was born. <laughs> So they began doing that in the 70s and stuck with it. Barry Barish was a LIGO laboratory uh, director that saved the project at the time that had trouble in the early times. So they got the Nobel Prize in 2017 with credit, with affiliation to the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. The LIGO collaboration is a collaboration of a thousand scientists, including our group at LSU, that works to make these detectors work, to develop the technology, to analyze the data, and to give you talks like this. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about scientists, and I want to ask you a few questions. When, you, when I ask you to imagine a physicist, who do you think of? Einstein, right? <laughs> That's the prototypical uh, physicist. That's what we think about the famous physicist. Now, I also think about Keep and Ray. <laughs> However, that's not the image you should have in mind. They did the work I'm talking about when they were a lot younger. 
This is Einstein when he published the theories of special and general relativity. This was Ray Weiss when he started uh, at MIT and Keith Thorne, he's kind of a hippie, <laughs> in, <laughs> when he was a young professor at Caltech. And you may not see a physicist in that, but those are real physicists. That's how physicists look like when they are doing work, <laughs> not when they receive credit after long, a long time of doing the work. And they are not the only ones. This is, like I mentioned before, a big, big team. I cannot put a thousand people in here, but this is the, this is the team at, at, at LIGO Livingstone. Uh, this is a team at Caltech, a team at MIT. This is the people who were at the announcement. But the team I liked the best was our team at LSU <laughs> celebrating. This is the young people in our group, students and postdocs, who were celebrating that February 11, 2015. These are all scientists. Scientists, engineers, technicians. This is the team that makes scientific discoveries. So when you read in the news about science discoveries, don't think of Einstein. Think of a pretty woman, or a fat guy, or myself or yourself. I hope you can see yourself as a scientist. We come in all colors, all sizes, all uh, ages. We have young people, senior people, all together working in this team. Now that was the first gravitational wave and still has a record of being the strongest. But we have discovered many more since then. We recently had a publication with 11 signals that we discovered between 2015 and 2017. 10 of these were all black holes. The last one, you can tell it's a lot longer. It's a lot longer meaning that these were smaller objects. And in fact, these we know were not black holes. These were neutron stars. Neutron stars are, have the mass of the sun, but compacted in the size of Baton Rouge. <laughs> they are very, very dense stars. And I'll show you a movie because that's great. But first, let me show you this plot that puts our discoveries in context. We have discovered these 10 mergers of black holes. This is, indicates the mass of the black hole. Uh, the one that we had in the beginning uh, was uh, this one, I think. That was the first one. This is the heaviest one. This is the lightest one. So we have of several different sizes. These purple ones are the ones that we knew about before our discovery. They were all with smaller masses. They were kind of these masses but we have discovered much heavier black holes. So we are still trying to understand that this is the same kind of black holes, different black holes. We are doing black hole astronomy, even though black holes do not emit any light, but we can do astronomy now with gravitational waves. With the neutron stars, these are the neutron stars that we know about, all between one and two, two and a half solar masses. These are the two neutron stars that we saw merging into an object that we don't know what it is. Because it's heavier than any known neutron star, it's lighter than any known black hole, so we don't know what it is. Every scientific discovery opens new doors, creates new questions, and that's what happened with this one. Now, I told you before that the credit for the Nobel Prize was, the affiliations for the Nobel Prize were to the LIGO and Virgo observatories, or the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. So the LIGO collaboration operates the two de LIGO detectors in the US and a shorter detector in Germany, a 600 meter detector that we use to develop technologies. 
In Italy, however, there is another detector called Virgo of about the same size as LIGO. This has three kilometers in a beautiful region in Tuscany. And that one is managed by the Virgo collaboration. And we take data together and we put it all, we put all the data together. And that's because if we have more detectors, we can triangulate. You know what triangulation is? Triangulation is when we measure the time difference of events, sound events or, or sparks or whatever signal there is, in this case, gravitational waves, if we measure the time difference between the events at three different sensors, then we can know where the signal comes from. That's what GPS does to know where you are and to tell you where to go. It uses light from triangulation from the GPS satellites on your phone. So that's what we can do if we have more than two detectors, and that's why we use Virgo. But there are two other detectors in, in construction. Well, one is about ready to take data. That's in Japan, in an, um, in, inside the mine, inside the mountain, and another observatory being built in India. This is called Kagra. This is LIGO India. But for now, we take data with three detectors. And that makes things a lot better because if you only have two detectors, then when you want to know where the signal came from, you say, well, it came from there. <laughs> it's a big half a circle in the sky. That's all you can tell with two detectors. But if you have three detectors, then you can localize the signals a lot better. So these were detections made with three detectors, Han for Livingston and Virgo in alphabetical order. And you can tell that that's a lot better. We could tell astronomers, go and look there. Now for black holes, we don't expect to see anything because if you have two black holes, neither one producing light, merging, we don't expect that to produce light and we haven't seen any electromagnetic waves from those. But from this one, the one that was a merger of neutron stars, we saw it. In fact, the first thing we, uh, we the sci scientists, astronomers saw after the merger was a gamma ray. This is a Fermi detector, a satellite detector that detects gamma rays. Those are electromagnetic waves of high frequency and then Less than two seconds after the merger that we measured, there was a peak in that detector. So we knew that were electromagnetic waves coming from this. And notice that this difference might, might not seem small in here, but we could tell that these waves had traveled 130 million years to reach Earth. And the electromagnetic waves and the gravitational waves took 130 million years with only two seconds of difference. So that's proof of that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Another prediction of Einstein theory. But more than that, because we could localize it that well in the sky, then astronomers went there and looked for galaxies in there and did a couple of dozen galaxies in there. And there was this one galaxy that had a blue spot that had not been there before. And then it converted, it changed the color and it changed into a red spot. And then it disappeared, but it could be seen also it could also be seen in the ultraviolet, in the infrared, more or less at the same time that the, that the red and the blue spots were there. But 10 days later, when the blue and the red light had gone away, we could see it in the radio and in X-rays. So the two neutron stars merging had produced a lot of light, a lot of electromagnetic waves. And putting it all together, this is a movie that NASA made of this information. We had the two neutron stars producing gravitational waves, dancing this tango, although it's not tango music, getting closer together, merging, producing the gamma rays, then producing more light. 
website that is through on the web live, and then later on we'll be simply the way the way of the next way. So this was the first time that we could learn about the system using light and gravitational waves. I like to say that here we could not just see the universe, but hear the universe. Now we have put sound to the movies. And this is called multi-messenger astrophysics. And we are, this is just the beginning. Now, another thing that we are learning from that is how gold is produced. Because it turns out this has been a mystery for a lot of years that we don't know where gold comes from. We know that most of the elements on Earth come from stardust. Stars exploding, and then the dust of the stars comes to Earth. And that's how iron and helium and hydrogen were done in what produced in the very early universe, but all the other, other elements up to iron in the, in the periodic table come from stardust. Have you ever heard that? That's what I'm saying that I love. We are all stardust. <laughs> but gold isn't. It actually turns out that the, amount, the abundance of gold, not just on Earth, but in the sun, and in, uh, the abundance that we measure in the stars, cannot be explained from supernova explosions, which was the canonical, um, the canonical explanation. There's uh, too much gold. So the other explanation was, well, it may come from the merger of neutron stars, from all that dust that is produced when neutron stars merge. But nobody had seen neutron stars merging before. And now we saw it. We need to see more to prove this theory, but we are looking at the origin of gold. Isn't that amazing? Now, getting to the future, let me show you first what we have done first. In the first observing run that we had in 2015, with LIGO, we had three binary black hole detections. In the second observing run that we did in 2016-17, we had seven more black holes. That was the catalog I mentioned, and this amazing binary neutron star system. We began taking data again last April in our third observing run. We are going to be, be taking data until end of April this year. And we have seen so far 49 candidates. We haven't confirmed them all. We have only confirmed one that was another binary neutron star merger, but 49 compared to only 11 we had seen before. And actually we are still taking data we have apps, so you, this data is public. Uh, the alerts are public. There are two apps you can download, and I should look because there might be 50, but no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Actually, my phone has a sound when, it, when a gravitational wave comes, but uh, I have it muted. So you can find out when gravitational waves go through Earth within minutes and you can play with these sounds. Now, the sounds, the, I keep talking about sounds, these are of course not sounds, but gravitational waves that we measure in the gravitational wave detectors and only a corner of the spectrum of gravitational waves. Just like light, gravitational waves have many different frequencies. If the black holes are larger, they produce in their, in their merger, gravitational waves of smaller frequency. Small, too small for us to measure. We need to make the detectors much longer. So there's a project that puts three satellites in space. You have three satellites. They are two and a half million kilometers. They will be two and a half million kilometers apart with lasers going uh, between the satellites to measure gravitational waves from those black holes at the center of galaxies and from white dwarfs in our galaxy. That project is called LISA, and it's going to be flying in about 2034. It sounds far, but not, it's not far. You will be in college by then. <laughs> uh, 
uh, or in graduate school. We, if we want to measure even lower frequency gravitational waves, we need even longer arms. So we build, we have made for us an interferometer in the galaxy. We detect radio signals, and when I say we, it's not LIGO, it's not me, it's the radio astronomers that do this, scientists in general. Uh, we use radio waves that come from pulsars in the, in the galaxy, and we see whether the distances are changing in a synchronized way between the different ones. So it's like measuring interference between those radio waves. But this is across the galaxy. So we have a galactic size interferometer. And that is going on. And my bet is that these, these people are going to detect gravitational waves before we launch LISA. And when LISA is launched, she's going, after a year or two, there's going to be a lot of gravitational waves. And there are experiments, too, for measuring gravitational waves of the early universe, the beginning of the universe. But that is different, so I leave that for another talk or for Kip Thorne to explain when he comes. So this is a story of gravitational wave astronomy made here in Louisiana, among other places in LIGO. And you can be part of it. You can visit LIGO, like I said, every third Saturday of the month. And if you are interested in science in general, you can listen to LSU science, scientists in Saturday Science. I know some of you were at uh, a talk I gave at the, Baton Rouge, at the East Baton Rouge Library uh, last month, next month. Uh, in March, there is uh, Phil, Ad uh, Phil Adams talking about, um, not Phil Adams, uh, sorry, David Young talking about sports, the physics of sports. He's going to explain this record pole uh, uh, jump that was made by an LSU athlete just a few days ago. So that's all I have for you. Thank you for listening, and I hope I get your questions now. If you have time, I'd love to answer some questions. Does anybody have questions? No? I feel very sad when I don't have questions. Yes. You have to speak very loud. Yes, stand up and speak loud. Besides neutrons from the neutron stars, yes. We call them neutron stars, but they're not only made of neutrons. <laughs> they, they, they have atoms with a lot of neutrons in the nucleus, very, very heavy elements. But they stay in the star because they don't get away. But when the two stars collide, then the, these elements go away, and not only go away, but they collide with each other and produce even heavier elements. And that, that's a very good question. Yes? We're the center of the universe? The universe does not have a center. You know, that's very strange. Yes, I remember when I heard that the universe is expanding, one tends to think, well, it's expanding because everything is moving away from us and we are at the center, right? No, that's not true. Everything is expanding. If you sat in a planet in another galaxy, then you would see all the other galaxies getting away from yours. So every place is the center of the universe. It's weird, <laughs> but it's true. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, we actually, when this was approved, and your parents paid for this because the National Science Foundation uses federal money, tax money, to pay for these laboratories. When this was approved, it was not really to prove Einstein right or wrong, although we do test Einstein's theory with all the discoveries. It was to do astronomy. It was because we could see black holes, and you can see everything we've learned about black holes in only a couple of years <laughs> since we discovered them. So uh, it was about doing astronomy with a different instrument, with a like I said, adding another sense to the way we perceive the universe. Now it's like having eyes and ears. It was for doing that science. Now that's also basic science. We don't know where that will lead. We all think that basic science leads to technology development later on, but we don't know how that's going to happen. For the technology that, that had to be developed for these instruments, we have pushed the boundary in optical engineering, in, in seismic isolation, in laser technology. So there has been spin-offs in those cases, but it's all basic science. But you know, this is another Einstein anecdote. I think that if Einstein had been asked, what's good your theory for? He would have said to understand the universe a bit better. And nowadays, we have to use Einstein theory to correct GPS measurements because of the curvature of the space-time due to Earth. The, the clocks, the GPS clocks and our clocks here on Earth are not synchronized because they are at different distances from the Earth. So if we don't use general relativity, if we don't use Einstein's theory, we get the GPS wrong. He would never have predicted that. So that's the way science and technology evolve. Oh, great, thank you. I didn't get that. How does, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> How did it? Oh, how will it benefit mankind? Yes, that's what I was talking about. I am not sure. <laughs> uh, this basic science, when we do basic science, when we try to understand the laws of the universe, we don't have a technological application in mind. But we are confident that there will be technological applications, but it might take a hundred years. I might not be alive when we see what gravitational waves can be used for. We know, but I, don't, I shouldn't say we know, but we don't think they can be used for communication because they are so difficult to produce. We cannot make black holes move the way we like them to move. So we cannot produce gravitational waves that could be measured for communication. So we don't have an application in mind. But I'm confident that in a hundred years, a lot of the technology that we developed and things that we didn't think about will be there. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we think black holes swallow everything, and they don't. You know, if the sun became a black hole, the, you know how the earth would move? It would be going around exactly the same way. It wouldn't be swallowed into the black hole. It would be just going around because the black hole would have the same mass on the sun does, so it will uh, have the same Newton's gravitational force even though it is a black hole. However, this, this, we wouldn't have light, we wouldn't have heat, so we would probably die very, very soon. That's a sad thing.
Okay. We, yes. Yeah, it was a twisted path, actually. I, like I mentioned, I was born in Argentina. I went to school in Argentina. And it wasn't about your age that I, I always liked math. And my mom was a math professor. So I always saw myself as a math professor because I liked teaching very much. And I liked my mom very much. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but in school, I learned chemistry and physics too. But chemistry... Uh, it, to me, learning about the atoms and the, and the nucleus and the electrons, and then think, thinking that everything is made of atoms and, and the universe is made of <laughs> atoms, made me think that if you understand atoms, you understand the universe. And that was physics. So I went to college to learn about physics. I wasn't thinking about being a scientist because I didn't know any scientists. In fact, I didn't know that the science was not in the books already. <laughs> I went to, to read all the books and learn about all the science, and then I discovered, well, not all the science is done, not all the answers, not all the questions are done, and I loved it. I loved creating questions, asking questions. I was always a very curious girl, and then I finished college there. I came to the U.S. to do a PhD. That's when I discovered this LIGO project, and I loved it, and I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> Is there a? Oh, yes, yes, actually, uh, not all the, uh, I think he's been raising his hand for a while, but uh, not all, <laughs> uh, not all the, not all the people who study physics become scientists because we need uh, physics degrees for lots and lots of other things. So people who go to college and study physics, about, the, uh, about half of them go to graduate school to get a PhD. The other half go to work in industry uh, and, and in teaching, in teaching high school. And actually the ones who go to industry earn very good money. <laughs> Uh, and then the ones, the ones that finish a PhD, it's only about a third uh, that go to teach in a college or a university. The others go to industry again or to do consulting, go into finance, into lots of other things. My, of my students, of students that have uh, worked with me, um, I, there is one working in oil industry, another working in Google, another working in uh, informatics, uh, and then there are two that are now professors. <laughs> so they, and, oh, and there are two in NASA. <laughs> No, actually, uh, of course, there are, we know that there are big, big black holes at the center of galaxies, and they would produce gravitational waves that we would detect with, the, with LISA, with the space system. But there are also stars in our galaxy that are called white dwarfs. And they are relatively compact, but not as compact as neutron stars. They are much bigger, much, much fluffier, so they're bigger. Uh, and those would produce also low frequency gravitational waves that we would also detect with LISA. In our frequency band with LIGO, we only see the smaller compact objects like black holes and neutron stars, but we hope to see these rotating neutron stars and these bursts from supernova explosions. Do I know of a black hole nearby? Is that what you?
You know, that's a question where Keith Thorne is the expert. <laughs> we don't have any information about what happens inside the black hole because nothing gets out of the black hole, so no information gets out of the black hole. But there are theories, and, and at the center of the black hole is what we know that we don't have any theory, any proven theory. Einstein's theory breaks down. You have to divide by zero, so you get infinity if you are at the center of the black hole. So some people think that at the center of the black hole, you could end up going into the center of another black hole. <laughs> and then that would be a wormhole. <laughs> and you could get to another black hole or another universe. And like I said, Keith Thorne is an expert on this, <laughs> uh, but I am an experimentalist. And until we have experiments that tell us somehow what happens inside the black hole, I don't believe in, in any, <laughs> any other strange thing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't hear very well. I couldn't hear. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, actually, it's, our son will die a quiet death. It is not one of the stars that will explode. Some stars just go dark and that's going to be the sun's end but that's going to happen so 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 far in the future that i wouldn't worry yet i would worry more about taking care of our earth so that we survive while the sun is hot <laughs> I, I'm sorry, gravitational force? Oh, well, you know, gravity is, even though it makes us fall, <laughs> It's a very, very weak force. So it doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect us. It, the lack of gravity <laughs> does. So there are lots of experiments being done in the International Space Station uh, on how the lack of gravity or being so far from the Earth affects the body, uh, but not, not, uh, there are no strong effects that we know of. Uh, well, in principle, there is, there should be, I should say, but Einstein's theory is a classical theory. And we know that quantum mechanics is the theory that explains, that has the explanation for all the particles that we know, but we don't have yet a quantum theory of gravity. There are some candidates about the quantum theory of gravity, and some people here at LSU work on that, my husband in particular. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we don't have yet any predictions for, of effects that we could measure to know which theory is right or what are the details of the theory. So according to Einstein, uh, Einstein's theory, there is no limit on the mass of the black hole either big or small. Are there any other questions? Okay, maybe. <laughs> maybe now it's time to say goodbye. Is there another question? Oh! <laughs> I
I'll be I'll be out there. I'll be out there answering questions if you want to talk with me and if your classmates want to wait. But we have a few announcements before people leave. Uh, Bernita, please. Did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. All right. Well, first I would like to um, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Gabrielle Gonzalez for having such love and passion for her field of work that she was able to come and put this presentation together for you with a two-day notice. So for that, can you please give her a round of applause? <laughs> And I would also like to thank you guys again for coming out. And we hope to be able to see you in more of our events and programs that we have. We would also like to um, extend the invitation again to you guys every third Saturday at LIGO. We are free and open to the public. We would love to see you there at our exhibit halls and our demonstrations. Also with this um, uh, program that we're working with. We would love to be able to come out to your schools and, and do demonstrations with you guys and have your teachers invite us out. We are um, free and open to the public for that as well. So we hope to see you again with our future events and programs. And um, some logistics that we need to take care of. Um, parking. Informed us that some of you guys were coming from across, crossing across Highland Road. Please have your buses pick you up on the side right here. The gates are open just for you guys so you can safely load and unload on this side of the Union Theater. So if you can have any transportation, anybody that's driving your buses or on the transportation that you used to arrive here to pick you up from this side, please do not cross over Highland Road. All right, thank you. Thank you.